Good morning. I'm Paul Merriman, and I am thrilled to be with you today. This is a, such a special occasion for me, not only having received that uh, the Clunan Award, which is which is uh, wonderful, but also just to be back with AAII members, uh, the savvy investors. Always fun to to share with you, and today. I have a, a special guest myself. About 20 years ago, my wife actually attended a six-hour workshop that I gave, and uh, and she's back for the first time in 20 years to watch one of my presentations. And I'm glad she's here for this one because in some ways, this is the best I've got to offer. Somebody recently said, if I had a dollar for every time Paul Merriman said small cap value, I'd be rich. Well, he's going to be richer today, and my hope is, is that you will be too. So let's talk about small cap value. But first, I want to make sure you understand what it is that we as a foundation are attempting to do for you. We serve do-it-yourself investors. I made a living serving people who wanted somebody to do it for them. But with a do-it-yourself investor, knowledge becomes so much more important. And we believe that you put the knowledge together with confidence and discipline, you've got a great do-it-yourself investor. And that's a tall job because there's a lot to know. So we try to bring the tools, the information that are going to give you the highest probability of success and success in a very specific area. We're not tax experts. We're not financial planners. Uh, we're, we're not estate planners. We focus in on what we consider to be a handful of the most important decisions you're going to make. That would include selecting the best equity asset classes. We know that equities are the gas, and, and, and that's where you're going to get your growth. Let's make sure you're in the right place. We also think it's important to give you an idea of how much equity or how much what percentage of each of these equity asset classes you would have in your portfolio, depending on what your long-term goals might be. And then always trying to determine what's that ratio of, a, of the break to the gas the bonds and the stocks. And then we get to distribution time, retirement, and how to take retirement distributions fixed versus flexible, and then how much you can take out. And we show tables that show three, four, five, six percent distributions. And with a recent addition of a calculator, even more choices. And then for a lot of investors, we're trying to help them put together that lifetime glide path. Target date funds do that automatically. Well, if you're not going to have it done automatically, would you consider some steps to create one for yourself? And finally, we believe that do-it-yourself investors would at least like to know what funds, what ETFs should you use in order to build this portfolio? And we, with the help of some really smart people, do that for you as best we can. Uh, not quite a year ago, we came out with a new book. It is by far the most popular book that we've ever written. And I've, I've tried to figure out why, and I think I know why. I think it's because not only do we share 12 important decisions, forks in the road, that each one of those are worth a million dollars or more in the future. And, and that's... <laughs> That's a lot of extra money if you get these 12 forks right. And what I believe makes the book special is that we have focused in on these small steps that historically lead to huge rewards. And let me just show you how we try to quantify that so that it's not just a hope and a prayer, but there's actually something, some substance that could happen. So here's the presentation that we where we start we start about the possibility of just making an extra one half of one percent i'm here today to try to show you how to make an extra half of one percent if you're 20 that's a really big deal if you're 80 not so big 
but still worth the effort. So two people, two scenarios. One is you start uh, and you start investing over a, a 67 year uh, period, I, I should say 46 year uh, period, and you put away uh, $5,000 a year. One person that does it gets 8% during the accumulation. Uh, then they get 6% during the distribution and they take 30 years of distributions at 4% a year. I mean, these are the assumptions. That's the first person. The second person, instead of making 8%, makes eight and a half. I don't care how you pick up that extra half a percent. It turns out there are lots of ways to do that. I'll focus on one today. And in retirement, they also add an extra one half of 1%. That's So all we're asking, in order to show the value of whatever this step is, is to have a period to add that half percent in the accumulation and in the distribution. But as I say, even if you're stuck in the distribution period, it adds value. Let's see what happens to that money. What we know is that you will both have put away $230,000. And at the end of the 46 years, the person who made the 8% will have 2.8%. 26 million. And at the end of their life, given that they make six and spend four, they end up leaving $3.8 million for heirs after taking $3.5 million in distributions. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the real return on your investments. At the end of your life, if somebody said, well, I wonder how John did. Well, what I would want to know is how much money did he take out? How much did he leave? That is the end result. I don't really care how much he put in. I want to know that he enjoyed it. And maybe if he wanted to, he left some for others. So together, between the money that you spent and you leave, the total is $7.3 million. But the person who made an extra one half of 1%, they're going to have a little more money at retirement. Instead of 2.3 million, they end up with about 2.66 million. Now, that doesn't look like a huge home run, but it means you're going to have more money distributed and it means you're going to leave more to others. And if you continue to, to squeeze out that extra half a percent, it means that instead of 3.8 million, you will have a value at the time you retire uh, of at, at, at the end of your life of 5.1 million. And instead of withdrawals of 3.5 million, it's 4.5 million. So we're talking about the combination of the withdrawals and what you leave to others being 9.6 instead of 7.3. And that's an extra $2.3 million from a one half of 1%. I don't care if that's because of lower expenses or more tax efficiency or less turnover or you know active versus passive. There's all sorts of ways that you can be thinking about that one half of 1%. And our job is to try to put those on the silver platter. Well, let me just uh, spoiler alert here. The biggest decision a young or an old investor will probably make is how much in fixed income and how much in bonds. And I just quickly want to show you bonds from 1928 to 2020, the long-term government bond, $100 invested in 19, uh, 1928, grew to be worth almost $17,500. Intermediates, a little less, short-term less. And that was about a 5.7% compound rate of return. And I'm just thinking, I'll bet there are a lot of people here today that would like to believe that bonds might give them a 5.7% compound rate of return. Now, remember, I'm looking for a lousy one half of 1% here. And what do I see? I see for that same period of time, large cap blend, the S&P 500, compounded at 10. Large cap value, compounded at 11. What's the difference? The large cap blend is more, well, it's a growth and value, but growth is way more important in that portfolio. And that means that the value without the growth did better. Why? Because it took more risk. And how would one be able to take 
determine what's the value, what's the growth. Well, value is for some reason a company being undervalued, whether it's it's represented by a low PE ratio or a high book value versus market price. There are a number of ways to identify value, but what we know is historically there is a premium paid for that additional risk. And how do I know there's more risk? Let me go back here for one second. I know that because I look at what happens in the best and worst of times. In the best of times, a 92% gain for the large value. For the S&P 500, a 54% gain. The worst year, a negative 43. These are calendar years. Negative 43 for the S&P 500, a negative 61. There's all sorts of ways to measure risk, but trust me, if you will, large cap value is more risky than large cap blend. The same is true when we look at small cap. We know that there's a small cap premium historically that smaller companies that are around, let's say, two to six billion versus large companies that are worth you know, 75 to 100 billion and more. That difference for small has paid a premium, and it turns out the premium is pretty close to another 1%. And then if you take the growth out of that small cap blend and are left just with small cap value, historically, you get about another 1%. And if you, by the way, uh, want to put your money in all four of those asset classes, it turns out that your $100, instead of growing to 712000 grew to three point, about $3 million, whereas, by the way, $100 in small cap value grew to about $9.3 Of course, that's a lot of, uh, of compounding, a lot of years. But when we go about 40 years, that very scary thing that happened during the one years, all those times that you were down 10, 15, 20, even 40 or 50 percent, those scary short-term problems evaporate if you let them. And that is when you look at the average compound rate of return of the S&P 500 over the last uh, uh, 93 years, it turns out the average 40-year compound rate of return was 11. How did it go from 10 to 11? Because that 40 years includes for a few years, 29, 30, 31, 32. Get rid of those terrible years and all of a sudden the picture looks better. I'd like to see those included maybe to get a greater idea of the reality of the process. But what I do know is all of these assets do the same thing. They get way more than bonds, and the vanguard, the, the value does better than the blend, and the small does better than the large. So small value, as a matter of fact, the average compound rate of return, and I, you know, I don't have an expectation that it's going to be this way in the future, because I can tell you that during most of that time, of that 90-some that years, people didn't even know what small cap value was. They do now. But over that period of time, that's what happened. And oh, I should mention, look over here at the four fund combo. Average return, almost 3% better than the S&P 500. I'm thinking, by the way, and I've looked at that four fund combo for probably a thousand hours trying to understand every inch of what's happened there. And I'm thinking it's a better investment long term. If I had the choice between the S&P 500 and the four fund combo, I would be in the four fund combo. But we don't think of investing over 40 years. We really judge it one year at a time. Now, we know better intellectually, but as, as, as lots of experts have taught us, when it comes to sex and food and money, these are not intellectual uh, uh, processes. They are emotional. And it seems like a year, and I think Larry Swedro talked yesterday about one year and three years and five and 10 years of performance is meaningless statistically. And yet, boy, does it mean something to us, particularly when you're 70 some years old and you haven't got long to live. These things that happen now become more important. Well, we can learn a lot from looking back to 1928 and looking at every year. And my thanks to 
to Daryl Balls, who put this quilt chart together. I just love it because, because what you get to see is the bouncing ball of the S&P 500 and small cap value and small cap land and large cap value and the four fund strategy. And there's only one of these investments that looks like it has any consistency at all because they're all over the place. We think that the S&P 500 is supposed to have the lowest return because it's the least risky of these asset classes. And yet what happens is that oftentimes, many times, it's right up at the top. And that's not, you know, you, you tell somebody about small cap value, they expect it to do well, at least within a year or two. No, there are times it doesn't do well within a year or two. But I think this allows you to see two things. One is that if you're trying to make a judgment based on a short period of years, you're probably not going to get it right. And the other is the stable investment here is not the S&P 500 or large cap value. It is really the four fund strategy. The four fund strategy ends up right in the middle uh, 72 out of the 92 years that are represented uh, by this particular uh, table. So I hope you look at that and take some time with it. I certainly have looked at it for a lot to, to get some sense of how crazy things can be. And then to go by, to go back and try to, if you want to just for the interest of it, and AAII like to do these kinds of things, you folks do, I think. I look at a year and I say, what does that year tell me? Like 1997. In 1997, small cap value was at the top of the heap, up 39.2%. And small cap blend was up 29.1%. But wait a minute. You got a small at the top and a small at the bottom. What does that say about small? Well, it probably says that small was not the 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 the, the, the Big winner. The big winner turned out to be value in that particular year. And the blends are at the bottom. What's in the blends? Growth. So that was a better year for value than it was for growth, whether you were big or whether you were small. And the next year, 1998, everything turns over. S&P 500 blend growth. Oh, look, S&P 500 number one followed quite a ways behind U.S. large cap value and the small down at the bottom, that tells me that large was a major part of what was better. And it looks to me also like growth was probably quite a bit better than value because I see that between the small cap, cap bland and the small cap value and the S&P 500 and the large cap value. Every one of these years tells you a story. And the story I like about the four fund strategy is that consistency. And as we go out for more years, it starts to be more regular. Small cap value for four decades, 1940s through the 1970s at the top of the heap. Sometimes by a lot, sometimes by a little. And by the way, notice the number one producer back in 1930 to 39, that was a 4.9% compound rate of return versus some big losses down here on a compounded basis with the values. And of course, everybody knows that over a lot of the last 30 years, the S&P 500 has been the hot place to be. Not over the entire period, because remember, the S&P 500 is supposed to produce the lowest returns. But in all cases, not always. But I do notice something I think is very special. I'm, I'm, and I'm not here to sell the four fund combo. I'm here to talk about small cap value. But I'm still impressed because when I think about risk, I think that the four fund combo is less risky than the S&P 500. In fact, in fact, in the two decades, the S&P 500 was king of the hill here. The, the 90s, where the S&P 500 compounded at 18.2, the four fund combo was pretty close at 17. And in the 2010-2019 period, the S&P was up 13.6, 12.2 for the four fund combo. So, by the way, that 
four fund combo is 25% in small cap value. And as we get out to 20 year periods, it even becomes more normalized. S&P 500 in the bottom half all the time, the value, small cap value in the up half, upper half all the time, small cap blend mostly in the upper half. There's that straight liner, the four fund combo. So why won't people put money into small cap value? Well, for a lot of reasons that people won't put money into stocks. Because if you look at the long-term return, everybody said, well, yeah, of course you should have money in equities. That is where you make your money long-term in passive investments. But the real trip is often more difficult than people know. I, I know Larry Swedro in, in, the, in the panel on factors uh, showed, a, showed a piece about how often the, the S&P 500 is outperformed for long periods of time by, I think, T-bills. In this particular case, Daryl Balls did a, uh, did a great job of presenting that relative return of the S&P 500 and U.S. small cap value going back to 1930. And whenever this line is going down here, that means that the S&P 500 has been doing better than small cap value. And when the line is going up, it means that small cap value is relatively, accumulatively doing better. And what we want to know, one part is we want to know how much more did small cap value make, some multiple of the other, and why is it that it's so doggone hard to hold that company, that, that asset class? Well, I want you to notice something I think is fascinating, and, and it's something that uh, I, I think many of you probably know. But if you invested in small cap value, nobody knew what it was, by the way. But if you did, and the academics have drug out all the returns, you would have found that you took the risk of a much more volatile asset class, and over the first 13 years, you did not offer any premium. Waste of time. If you'd known that, you would have just put your money in the S&P 500 and not put yourself at such risk. Because believe me, the, S, the, the small cap value was down a lot more during the rough periods of the 30s than the S&P 500. But then there is an explosion. And in three and a half years, there's a, an, a, an additional 136% in return to small cap value over the S&P 500, but here's the problem, and it's real because it has to do with how humans respond to momentum, to recency bias. It wasn't discovered that value, small cap value, was going to be better in the early years of this additional growth. In fact, you probably didn't get in there until at least it was a halfway through that three and a half year period. In fact, you might have gotten in the last half year of that three and a half year period only to have it go sideways for another 19 and a half years, followed by an explosion, followed by side years for, sideways for eight years, another uptrend over seven years, picking up an extra 192%, then a sideways movement for 17 years, then up 140, and then a sideways movement that's still going on, even though, yes, small cap value has done well lately, it still isn't back up to where it was way back then. And what do we know? There's the little number we're looking for, 24.3 times more money at the end of that period of time in small cap value over the S&P 500. Now, I don't want you to panic about all these small numbers. I can't read them either. You do have a PDF that I uh, I hope that you have, uh, have access, but you don't have to see all the small numbers, but I want you to know what's on this page. This is the most powerful tool that I have ever worked with as an advisor, where I could sit down with somebody across the desk and try to discover what is your desire for return? What is your risk tolerance? So try to put together the right portfolio, given those two things we want to find out. And so what is what are we doing? We're taking over here on the left side, the lowest risk equity or strategy, I'm not equity, but fixed income, 100% bonds on the left. Over here on the right is the S&P 500, 
And we got a whole bunch of tables like this with value and large cap. I mean, just different combinations of asset uh, classes. But in between the 100 in bonds and the 100 in stocks, 10% increments adding bonds as we go so that you can go back and you can you can see what I call the fright simulator. What was the ride like if I had invested in 50-50 stocks and bonds or 100% uh, equities? What would that ride? Would I have stayed the course? Now, this is very easy with the client, by the way, because you watch their eyes and you see how they're responding and you ask them questions. The challenge for somebody like myself as an educator, I'm not seeing the whites of your eyes when you're looking at this. I'm not there to ask some more questions, but I do want to take you to the bottom of that page because the bottom of that page tells so many great stories. One is it makes it real easy to see what happens to the returns as you go from 100% bonds to 10% in uh, equities, the S&P 500, and 90% in bonds, you go from 7.2 to 7.7%. I am thinking I have just hit a gold mine here. There is an extra, there is an extra one-tenth of 1% 1 right there. Okay. Uh, then, then I look down below and I look at the risks. I look at the risks of 100% bonds and 10% uh, uh, fixed uh, uh, and 10% equities and 90% bonds. It's about the same. In fact, even when I go to 20% in, uh, uh, in equity, it's still about the same. And what happens as you go to the right? You keep picking up little increments of four tenths of 1%, three tenths, two tenths, whatever it is, it's getting better as it's getting riskier. But now if we could construct a slightly different kind of a, uh, of a portfolio, uh, we have a combination of 100% uh, in the S&P 500 on the left. And we've never done this before a couple of months ago. And on the right, we've got small cap value. Well, let's talk about the implications of that combination. Looking over the last uh, 51 years, you can see that the S&P 500 compounded at 10.7 and the small cap value at 13.5. And um, uh, John, I'm gonna take a second because I show that my battery, even though I'm plugged into everything that I know to be plugged into here is, uh, is getting low. Suzanne, could you please come help me and see if you can figure out what is not plugged in? All right, I will hope that my wife will be able to help me. That will be a blessing. Here's here's what here's here here is what I see happening here. Uh, I see happening the possibility of not only getting an extra one half of one percent. I see the possibility of getting more than one half of one percent. But I am seeing. Uh, do me a favor, sweetheart. Would you go upstairs and uh, get the the charger and maybe I can plug in an, uh, another place here. Um, it's in the, it's in the TV room. Sorry for that real life. Uh, so at this point though, I just want to focus on that 10% or that 20% because I want to encourage people who aren't in this to get into this. So, oh, by the way, I don't want to forget this in 27 out of the uh, 51 years, the small cap value outperformed the, uh, S and P 500. And in 24 years, the S&P 500 outperformed. It is interesting to note that the outperformance uh, for the S&P 500 uh, was 11% in the years that it won, and the small cap value was 16.8% in the years that it won. How did it do? 90-10. Compared to the S&P 500, the question I get so often from old people, is it worth taking the risk to do this? Well, I'm thinking that it is worth that. Thank you. Honey. Now I got to figure out how to get that plugged into something. huh? What I know from the past is that, and this is thanks to, to uh, over here, honey. Thanks. Uh, this is Chris Pedersen who did this study for us. And, uh, and, and, and what we know 
is that over that period of time, in the five-year periods, the S&P 500 underperformed the small cap value 71% of the time. Then there were the 10-year periods where the small cap value was better 83% of the time, 15 years, 94% of the time, and 20 years, always. 20 years, always. Thank you very much. But what about if we look at 40-year periods? Over 40-year periods, it turned out that the return was 9% to 33% better because you put 10% value in there. That's substantial. And that range of additional return, the, the, the compound annual growth rate was from 0.22, sometimes not so much, to 0.72. But what makes me happy is that the average additional return was that one half of 1% we're looking for. And so it panned out. Let's put that in terms of dollars and cents. In dollars and cents, the S&P 500, a $10,000 investment, looking at 624 periods from 1928 to 2020, the average return was a total of $674,000. While the 9010 was $828,000. And I, I love it. Chris and Daryl always keep me honest. They always show me the worst of times. And that was the minimum return was 207 for the S&P 500, almost 208,000. And for the 9010, it was about almost 250,000. And finally, the maximum. The maximum was 1.6 million for the S&P 500 and 2 million for the 9010. What does that tell you about luck, by the way? Oh, oh by the, and, and it's important to know here is that that terrible 40 years started in 1929. The great 40 years started in 1932. Yeah, fat chance people would be excited about investing in 1932. But now I want to go back and I want to get serious. I want to get serious about how much you should have in small cap value. Uh, now, I don't mean it has to be small cap value with the S&P 500. We're going to look at it that way. But my wife and I have in the equity part of, of our buy and hold portfolio that we use to help support us in retirement. In the equity part, it's half small and half large. And the small part is half U.S. and half international. And the small U.S. and international is half small cap value and half blend. So it, it's interesting that you can have so many halves. And oh, by the way, well, I won't go into the other half. So here's what I know. I know that the S&P 500 with that 10% uh, made a difference. And I know that the difference in terms of losses, if you looked at the worst 12, 12 months in a row, there was a, a loss of 43.3% for the S&P by itself you had to be willing to lose six tenths of 1% more, 43.9. If you went to the 10%, you had to be willing to lose 44.5, a, a, a little over a percent more. As a matter of fact, let me get to the middle of the page here. If you went to 50-50, the worst 12 months was 46.3% versus 43.3 for the S&P 500 itself. And if we drop down to the bottom of this box, the, the worst drawdown peaked the valley before recovering was 51% for the S&P and for the 50-50 strategy, 55.8. Well, true to the words of Peter Lynch and Warren Buffett, if you are not willing to lose half of your money, you shouldn't be in stocks. And by golly, uh, they're right. You've got to be ready to lose half of your money. But you can see the decision-making power you have here with this tool because you can see what is likely to happen to you. I have made a number of guarantees over the years as, as an educator 
Because when I was building my business, I had three and six hour workshops where I taught how to do things on your own. And whether you are a client of the Merriman Wealth Management Company that I once worked for or, or you're a do-it-yourselfer, you've got to know that if you're in equities, it is guaranteed that a part of the time you're going to be losing money. And every one of us should know up front, not just how much money we want to make, but how much money are we willing to lose in order to make it? Because we know what happens. People give up if they get beyond their risk tolerance. Well, here's another kind of, here's another tool, another kind of, 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 of uh, uh, table set, table set of uh, columns of the same information, except now we're thinking about somebody who's just getting started as an investor. And what are the implications of starting with $1,000 a year paid monthly? And every year you in, increase the um, amount of money you put in by 3%, just kind of to address inflation. And yes, if you want to do it with 2,000 or 5,000, we use 1,000. It's easy to multiply twice, three times, or whatever it is to see what that final number would be. But let me show you what the final numbers are here. Oh, and before I do, I want to say that here's another one that does exactly the same thing, except instead of doing it with the S&P 500 over here on the right, uh, and 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 bonds uh, over here on the left. This one has the 50/50 stocks, U.S. and small cap value. So the question is, and here's the table to address it. Tables. If I look at the end result of 51 years of saving, you would have saved in both cases $117,000. The S&P 500, 100% in stocks, would have grown to be worth about $2.9 million. If you were more conservative and, and went 60-40, by the way, a lot of people do, I recommend 60-40 to a lot of young people who don't have the stomach for the stock market, would have been about 1.67 million. But if instead of using the S&P 500, instead, if you use the combination of small cap value and the S&P 500, instead of 2.9, it's 4.8. Instead of uh, uh, well, one point seven, it's about 2.27. Huge advantage. And I don't think that you took that much risk. By the way, risk gets really important when you're losing money. It becomes very personal. And so I always want to be careful, at least when I was an advisor and I could sit there and help, I would always force people to be a little more conservative than they probably wanted to be, particularly in a bull market. And we do accumulation for people. And now this is a, a, a sample, just a sample of the dozens and dozens of tables that we have on our site dedicated to distributions. We have fixed distributions. That means you start out with a certain amount. In this particular case, it's $40,000 out of a million dollar investment. You started with 40,000 and then every year you increase it if inflation increased. If we'd had deflation, we would have we would have decreased uh, the the, um, uh, the distribution. And what do we know? Well, I love, by the way, when I look at these tables, I would to look at it in 10 blocks. I don't have time to do that here today, but that's how I like to see it. And I like to compare, for example, our 50-50, my wife and, and I have the 50-50 uh, stocks and bonds versus the all stocks, but find something to compare to so you can think of the emotions of being at both sides of that. And here is what you would have had at the end of 51 years. I know that there's nobody probably here today. Well, maybe a few that are going to be around 51 years from now, but I just want, I just want you to see the long-term impact. It may not be you were even talking about it. it may be a grandchild. Let's just look at that, at that, that value at the end of the 51 years, starting out with a million, taking out, in fact, you would have taken out $7.9 million because of inflation. Because of inflation, it just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In fact, the last year's distribution was $272,000 to replace the $40,000 that was reflected in 1970. That's the terrible cost of inflation 
uh, to people. And, and lots of folks, as you know, are worried right now that we're about to get back into higher inflation. Well, I can see what happened, though. You left money to your heirs. If you were 100% in the S&P 500, you left $8.9 million. If you were, uh, let's say, 50-50, you left $7.2 million. But what if, what if you used the 50-50 S&P and small cap value as your equity position? Well, obviously, it's going to be a higher number. But I want you to, to notice that it gets a little dicier here if you're 100% in, uh, uh, in stocks in the 70s. Wasn't so big a deal over here in 50-50, but it was a big deal if you were all uh, equities. Now let's compare. Have some fun here and compare the 51 years of retirement. Remember 8.9 million? Well, let's start over here at 50-50. 7.3 million versus 33 million. Just, it's just compounding over time. Little advantages mean a lot. I teach my high school kids a five cent piece of bubble gum with 3% inflation over 2,000 years will cost $2.3 trillion billion. That's the impact of inflation. Okay, over here, that compounding turned the 100% stock portfolio not into $9 million, but 105 million. So it's huge. Remember I said every half a percent is a big deal. Well, it is. It is a big deal. Even at the 50-50 where you got half your money in, uh, uh, in bonds. So how are you going to maximize? How are you going to maximize the returns of small cap value? How do you pick the best small cap value fund or ETF? Well, you could just go to our website and we'll tell you the best ones we know, whether it's ETFs or mutual funds. But what you as a do-it-yourself, or if you don't want somebody's help, what you need to do is to minimize expenses. That's going to make a big difference. And you want to increase diversification. That's starting to me to sound like index funds. Is it to you? Well, I hope so. You just want to make sure that you're in the right place in small cap value. A lot of people really got attached to the small cap value funds that were comprised of larger companies over about a 10-year period because large were out, was outproducing small and growth was outproducing value. In a situation like that, what's going to happen is the larger small cap value is going to do better than the smaller small cap value. But for the long term, I'm thinking you want the smaller small cap value. You want more deep deeply discounted value if you can, if you have access to it. And lots of studies show that if you if you get small cap uh, uh, ETFs or funds that have focused in their building of the way they hold them, the ones they have in their portfolio, where they look at the profitability factor or the quality factor or the momentum factor. And if you're in a 401k like so many people are and you don't have small cap value, Maybe you need to move outside your 401k and do it in your IRA, hopefully a Roth IRA, and get lucky. Obviously, if you happen to invest at the, at, at the right time. When I met with John Bogle in, 19, in 2017, uh, we we're both old enough to be around in 1917, but in 2017, we both agreed that we were very, very lucky to have been able to be in equities during a period that just a plain old index fund could compound over 25 years at over 17% a year. An amazing period of time. I hope you get lucky. We have a lot of educational material, and then and and Chris Patterson, when it comes to the work on on uh, uh, ETFs and the best ETFs to be in, uh, he has done a, a yeoman's job, and he even explains it in great detail. And we also have whole portfolios of ETFs where you can put this all together: big cap, small cap, value, all those things in one portfolio as best we can help you. It's all free here for 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 your opportunity later to review take a look at what we at the end of last year recommended 
for this year to be the places to be in. Not everything turned out to be a winner in every asset class. Some did, some didn't. But you can see we also make recommendations. The aggressive means that it's 100% equity. The moderate is 60% equity. The conservative is 40% equity. And you'll see we also include bonds in those recommendations. And if you're going to be a good student, and if I'm going to be a good educator, we normally would like you to spend at least two hours after class doing learning more about what we talked about in class. I would hope that you spent that with Chris Pedersen in this great work that he has put together to talk about how he selects ETFs and 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 the and the rest of the information about trying to be the best that you can be as an investor. Take a second here, just a second, but it's one of the most powerful tools we have ever had. A young fellow learns about investing on our website just by chance. It's a it was a random event, but he ends up on our website he learns about investing. He is introduced to this 160 plus tables that we have, and he builds a calculator to be able to manipulate those 160 plus tables. And then after he uses it to make his own decisions, he came to our organization, Craig Apple, and he gave it to us to share with you. Uh, it, we have had great reviews I hope you'll take a look and know that we're working hard right now to make it better in the long term. But what a wonderful start because you can you can put in all your own numbers, whether you're accumulating or distributing, whether you want to take uh, in the uh, inflation into consideration. Uh, you want to look at a 3% distribution, 3.1, 3.2. It's all right there for you to do. And I've got to spend a minute. I've just got to spend a minute talking about somebody who was not able to attend today. It's a newborn child. And I want you to do something. I want you to teach them about small cap value. And it's only going to cost you a little money to, to, to put them to school on small cap value. Because I'd like you to invest $365 in small cap value in your name. And just let it go. Just let it go. Don't do, don't get in, don't get out. No market timing allowed. And then when that child has grown old enough that they've made some money that can be put into a Roth IRA, bang, that money goes into the Roth IRA. And then it is left there, left there until they are 70 years of age. And if that small cap value compounds at 12%, it will be worth over a million dollars. Ha! There you have one year's income in retirement 70 years from now. By the way, if you inflation adjust that for 3%, it's about $118,000, as I recall. So it's not like they're rich beyond. But if you decided you like this, then the next year you might do it again. But maybe you wouldn't put in small, small cap value. You want to teach them a lesson, you put it into large cap value or emerging markets or international something or or whatever that would continue to build a diversified portfolio. Some may put it all in small cap value every year. Try to keep those separate. Let each one represent what they need in year 70 and 71 and 72. It won't be enough, but it'll be a heck of a start. And will you be able to teach them a lesson be between the time they're born and when they're 21? What had happened by just building this diversified portfolio? Marvelous. Just marvelous. And by the way, I promise they'll never forget you. We're talking millions free. I want everybody to, to get the PDF. I want everybody to take the PDF and send it to their friends. Read it first and make sure there's not one thing in there that is self-serving for me. Okay, let's start there before you send it. And then I want you to send it in the hopes that it will educate the people to know about these $12 million decisions. And for those of you who like the idea of two funds for life, I know Chris is going to talk about that next, but two funds for life, he just released the book this, this, uh, this week, I think it came out, and it is a deep dive. The last half of We're Talking Millions is devoted to the two funds for life. But it is just skimming the surface. And Chris is an engineer. He takes it deep. And it's really a good book. And all the proceeds go to the foundation. 
and neither one of us get paid a penny. My favorite two quotes, well, not my favorite of all time, but my favorite Warren Buffett quote is, to be a success, you only have to do a very few things right as long as you don't do too many things wrong. I, we are doing what we can for both. To keep you from doing the bad things, hope you do the good things, and the only quote that makes my of my own that makes the, the top 200 list is never take an investment risk that doesn't pay a premium over the long term. Now, I know we don't have much time, but we have a little time. So, John, I am ready, if you are ready, to take some questions. Oh, I am ready, and the, the questions are, are, are coming in thick and heavy. So if anybody, uh, please take a look at the approved questions. Feel free to upvote them. Also, uh, feel free to keep asking questions. Um, oh, by the way, can I inter just interject please. there, John? It's more than we're going to be able to, to do here. I know that. I know it. But what I'm going to do, and Chris Pedersen's going to work with me, we are going to answer all the questions on a podcast that we weren't able to get to. It may be two podcasts, but we're going we're gonna to answer them. But go Thank ahead. So I'm much. sorry. Sounds, oh, that sounds wonderful. Uh, so I've got a question here from, uh, from Kevin. I'm planning on drawing down in 10 years. If small cap value stocks have a 14 plus uh, years of similar performance to the S&P 500, why would I select small cap value at this time? Well, uh, Kevin, uh, it, it, we're, I'm thinking long term. Now, I'm almost 78. I don't know how old you are. I wish I did because it would make my answer uh, uh, better, I think. But uh, I know there's a good probability, as I noted, that some small cap value is likely to add some return over the next 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Okay, so, so I have high confidence looking at the probabilities from the past. And that was only adding 10%. It gets better as I add more small cap value. But the other part is this. When I was an investment advisor, I found that a lot of people thought only of their investments for themselves and supporting them. And yet they had more than they needed to make it through life. And when you start asking them serious questions, kind of like a planner would, it turns out they really do care about leaving more to others if they can. In which case, I'm an advocate of investing in things that are for others, not for my life, but for our children and the charities we care about. So as I said earlier, I got half my portfolio in small cap. I know that's more aggressive. I also have half my portfolio. By the way, that's half of the equities. But I have half my portfolio in bonds. And I have enough to last and still take this risk. But you don't need to. You, sh you don't have to take any more risk than you need to. You touched upon this during your presentation, but a, a number of people are just asking to confirm, what are the qualities that you look for when looking for small cap value? What, you know, when, it, when it comes to a mutual fund specifically, what are the types of, it sounds like you touched upon having a, a low expense ratio. Also, you touched upon the notion that in the world of investing, uh, you know, many funds call themselves small cap, but there's a big difference. Some small cap funds are actually probably more in the mid cap area and uh, some small cap funds are truly in the micro cap arena. So what are the things you look for when considering a, a small cap value fund? Well, first of all, let me talk about where I'm going to look for this information, because if you're not using this information to make these decisions, you should be. I go to Morningstar. I look at the Morningstar page on the, and, and this, by the way, is what Chris does, except he looks at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them because he's trying to find the best for you. But I want to know what's the size, the average size of the company in the portfolio. You're going to find some of them are 1.5 billion to 2 billion, and some of them are are five to six billion, and they're still in the small class, yes, leaking into the mid cap arena. And so you're not getting the best. On the other hand, you might say, well, you know something? Uh, it's almost the same thing as maybe you've done with the S&P 500. You're not in growth. That's what's been so hot lately. You're in a fund that has some growth and some value and some in the middle, the core, but, but
But the bottom line is you may actually want to be in a less aggressive small cap value. It's not that they do poorly. I looked at one day this week, one day this week that was really good for small cap value. And the range of returns within the, the universe of small cap value was from one and a half to over 3% in one day. One and a half to 3%. One day, what were the common, the, the characters of those two? Larger and smaller, small cap value. That's all it was, the size. And, and, and so the smaller benefited more. But there are going to be lots of times when the larger small cap companies are going to do better, just like there are lots of times the S&P 500 beats small cap value. And then you talked about the, uh, the four fund combination um, area. What are the four asset classes that you look at for that kind of uh, combination? Thank you for asking. The four are the S&P 500. We call that large cap blend because it's partly growth, partly value. It's the large cap value without the growth. It's small cap blend, partly, uh, partly uh, uh, growth and partly value. And small cap value, it's without the growth. And those are the four asset classes. And it is interesting. I mean, when you go through, go back to that quilt chart that Daryl Balls made and look at those four asset classes one year at a time and how different they perform. You can have a year, there's 30, 30% 30 difference from the top to the bottom. And I, I think it's a great education. Here we go. Let's see. Um, and, oh, and I might add there too, John, we make recommendations for the four funds or the four ETFs you should be in. We're, we're taking all the work out of it because we're working for a lot of do-it-yourself investors who are really lazy. <laughs> well, you actually one of the things that I have to commend you on. I mean, you have a your sound investing podcast is 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 very worth. I mean, it's wonderful to listen to. I listen to it all the time. I get a lot of great information from it. And then typically once a year, normally towards the beginning of the year, you kind of review uh, which are which funds make up those particular uh, picks or recommendations that are the best in class for each of those segments. So whether it's a, a ten fund portfolio or a four fund portfolio. Or a two fund portfolio. So if members want to take a look at that information, go to the Paul Merriman website and you'll get all that information and they'll go discuss as to why they went ahead and, and did that information. And John, I might mention that we, the first of the year, do the same thing with all the fine tuning tables. The distribution tables are all updated and we go right back to the beginning and explain what they're about and how to use them. And we only have a two more minutes left here, but let's see here. How do you define value? Well, there some people define value as a low price earnings ratio. The academics that I have learned from uh, teach us that that the relationship between book value and the market price is a very efficient way, not just in return, but the cost of any trading that you have to do, that that is the the, the best measure. And so if you have high book value versus the market price, uh, then you have a really good value company, according to people who are putting together. And by the way, do not buy these one at a time. Buy them in a group. The academics will tell you five years from now, half of them will still be dogs. Buy the group and you get the winners. And let's let's close on this question here. So uh, James is asking, and he, you know, right now the it seems like the uh, stocks are priced expensive. You know, interest rates are low. Uh, you know, inflation is rising though, you know, how important is the, your expectation of the economy, your expectation of interest rates when it comes to setting up your asset allocation? Do you look at that, Paul? You just simply go for the allocation and let, you know, cause it's so difficult to forecast that stuff. I make no forecasts, clearly mechanical. I have no way to forecast. I've not found anybody I can trust to forecast. I am a, a, a mechanical investor all the way. I do not invest one dime for fun. Not one. I know this is heresy in this group, but I am here simply to take care of the family as best I can and hope that others will do the same. That's wonderful. And and Paul, thank you so much. Great presentation. And thank you. you know, thank thank you, goodness John. your wife was there watching today. 
Okay, yes, it's great. <laughs> she saved the day. <laughs> well, thank you, and, and look forward to putting a webinar together to answer more questions here, as you noted. Great. See you in a little while. Take care.